praise God for the gift of prayer. So I want to continue today on the second installment of our series called uh, Before You Say I Do. And now, now we've just been singing about trusting the Lord. And let me tell you, um, this is an area in which we need to trust the Lord. Specifically, we're talking about dating and maybe you're married and you've, you know, you're dating your spouse. I understand. So this subject is not directly tied to you, but it is tied to people that you know and love. Um, and we want us to speak wisdom to that issue because the, 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 the dating world today is, is toxic. It's, it's, that's, not even, that's, that's not even the word now. It's destructive. It's really bad. And um, I, it's unrecognizable even from the time that I, I've been married 23 years now. It's unrecognizable for me from the time that I was at an age where I was looking at prospective marriage partners. It just, it's just really different. People need some wisdom from the Lord and guidance in this area. Right, so we're going to talk about that, and I've been preparing in the last several weeks for this topic. Um, we had one series called uh, that was focused on dating, and we talked about how if you're single, the first thing you need to do is enjoy your single life. Like that's your first commission. Um, you you need to learn to enjoy it, and one of the ways you can is by giving it to the Lord. We talked about that. Secondly, we talked about the fact that the next thing you need to do, whether you end up getting married or not, is learn how to treat ordinary people. We had a series called Ordinary People. And just to treat everyone with dignity, respect, and honor, even the person, just even just the stranger you see maybe at the bus stop or in the store, what have you. Um, and then finally, last week in our first sermon in this series, um, we talked about dating, but indirectly by talking about there's a related topic to dating, and that is your friends, your acquaintances, and your advisors. Who are the folks in your life that are advising you and shaping your thinking um, this is vital, and most people don't think about that because where your fr the, the quality of your friendships affects the quality of your life, it certainly affects the quality of your dating life. And this area, uh, th that, that area should be taken very seriously, and we talked about it last week. So get, you can get that message on YouTube or on our website if you want to listen to that. And then really the idea, uh, what we said last week, is to take dating seriously. No, take dating very seriously. You should take it as seriously as you would if you were an employer looking for employees. If you're hiring someone, if you're doing, if you're, if you're advertising for a new employee, if you're doing it right, you get a lot of applicants, and most of them you never talk to. You, most of them don't get an interview. You're rejecting most of them because. Some people are applying for all kinds of reasons. Oh, they just want the money. Or, you know, some people interview just to interview. <laughs> some people, they're not really that serious, et cetera. So you, and you can easily spot them from the resume. It, basically, some people don't have hardly a resume or a couple of that's, that's telling you something, right? And so when you finally get down to the people you interview, it's just a handful of folks. Because first of all, you don't have a lot of time, right? And so, and then, like, if you get a second interview, like, this is almost, this is very serious. So this is, we went to, went to our last three candidates. You, you're one serious possibility, right? That's how we need to be with our dating life. If you're a believer, the world doesn't think like this. They see somebody cute, somebody handsome, somebody charming. They're at a casual interaction. They just accept all cookies. Let's go. You know, they just, you just, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, they, they just, an opportunity they, they, they are, they are, there are no inhibitions because they just see someone attractive, and there's no vetting process. We're going to get into this, okay? So you want to give serious consideration to who and how you date. Why? Because here's one big reason, okay? Because the cultural safeguards that used to be in place to protect you no longer exist, at least in the Western world. Okay? And by protections and safeguards... I mean, this is going to sound strange to many of your ears, arranged marriages. Arranged marriages. Now, again, that sounds strange. I certainly grew up thinking that was weird, the idea that my parents would decide who I would marry and I would have little say in who that person was, and that just seemed like, what if I don't like them? What if I'm not attracted to them? Like, I just, I couldn't imagine. I'm thinking in my head, right? And I've referenced this a lot, a lot of times, right? The, the movie, you've seen the movie Aladdin as one example, right? The, the, the father who wants his daughter to marry a certain person, he's the foolish one in the movie, and Jasmine and Aladdin are the smart ones. That's unrealistic. That's unrealistic. 
Aladdin is a thief. He's not going to run the kingdom. That happens in fairy tales. That doesn't happen in real life. In real life, it's the sultan who's the wise one and the young people who really don't know. But in the Western dating world, we have it backwards. Okay. Now, I'm not saying we got to go back and to arrange marriages. If I, I think it's neutral. They can work. They have their merits and their flaws, and the dating system has its merits and flaws. So I'm not saying one is necessarily better than the other, but I'm saying we've gone so far away from the, what some of those traditions provided that we're really lost now. So let me talk more about that. So again, the, the idea of an arranged marriage may receive a sharp reaction from many of you now, but for most of human history, arranged marriages were the norm around the world. Um, and um, basically that means parents arrange the marriage and the, and the, uh, the extended, and then the extended family and local community validated it through public rituals. And both your parents and the community had the power to determine if the marriage was going to happen or not. Some of this still happens today, right? It was not up to the bride and groom. Um, some of this still happens today in many Eastern cultures. Right today, I was what, what, what was I watching on? I was watching some YouTube clip or something like that. But uh, the parents definitely have a say, and some of it is tied to finances because um, in some places it's actually expensive to get married. I was reading one country; it's like it's, houses are so expensive. So to practically to get married, you got to get a house. Houses are so expensive. The parents help you pay for it, the whole nine, and and the parents get to kind of weigh into that. But uh, historically, it was even more involved than that, and. Um, People in the Western world think this is strange, but really, we're the weird ones. I say this because dating is still a very young concept. It hasn't existed for very long, maybe 150 to 200 years. That's just not how people got together. Human history has been, human beings have been, like, I know human history is full of troubles and all kinds of dynamics, but in terms of the stability of civilization, We've been fine for a long time before dating. And one of the reasons why dating couldn't exist before is because like, there was just no practical way for it to happen. Men and women were largely segregated. So men did men things, women did women things, and men and women weren't gonna casually interact in public, certainly without a chaperone. It just wasn't gonna happen. And you, you, you needed someone to arrange the marriage to even think, consider who your prospects would be. You wouldn't find someone out, first of all, women just didn't walk out in public like that by themselves. That just wasn't practical, it was dangerous, uh, it wasn't socially acceptable, it just, that just wasn't happening. And that, we had a long series talking about the Industrial Revolution, but that's part of what happened. Technology and women's mobility right, changed, and so you would see women out in public. And then, of course, now that you can see women, you can see women. And the prospect of a, a date was really about a pub, like men and women being out in public together. That was, uh, wasn't a thing before, right? So this obviously evolved, and we're here where we are now. Um, and again, I'm not saying we need to go back to that, um, and I'm not saying it doesn't have its drawbacks, but again, I'm saying we've, ha we've also lost something by rejecting it outright. So I want to say a few reasons why people would do this. Um, some, again, some of it, historically it was practical because how else were you going to meet somebody? That literally was how it was going to happen. But here are some other reasons, and I'm, I'm going to quote from uh, an article called The Practice of Arranged Marriages Among Christians in India. And it's from the Gospel Coalition website, and I'm just going to quote some things here. So... One was social and family support. Um, families obviously played a role in, in matchmaking, but also in providing security and stability. Now you're on your own to figure it out. This person right for you, not right for you. But in the ancient world, in many Eastern cultures, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a family system that will support you socially. You're not by yourself. You're not, you're not left to your own and trying to figure out what to do with your kids and 
you know, they, they, I mean, to some degree this exists today, but you'd have households, and then the household would be the patriarch and all of his kids and their spouses and their kids. I mean, you, you, you'd all have a place to stay. It was all worked out, right? What else? Compatibility assessment, right? The family had a long view of compatibility, not just for you individually, but what would be great for you long term and for the culture and for the society. And they would have the wisdom to understand, even though you couldn't appreciate it now, what would be better for you long term. So, and, but here's the things they wouldn't consider. They're not going to consider, I mean, if you were physically attracted to them, that's an aspect, but it's not the most important thing. Um, in fact, romance was not a part of it at all. And love was not always a part of it, at least initially. Right? So they would consider things like values. What are the values of this person and their family? Okay, what are their beliefs? What are their backgrounds? And of course, we know historically some of this was tied to the elite, people who wanted to maintain social status, et cetera. That's part of it as well. But it also happened in other people, people on the lower echelons of society economically, socioeconomically. Okay, what's another thing? Cultural preservation, right? Encouraging marriages within the same cultural or religious background preserves traditions and values, right? Really, really, values and traditions, super important, okay? And I'm going to emphasize that because, again, we're a 4G church, right? So if we're going to have, we're going to have longevity, if we're going to be around in the next century, two centuries, we have to have traditions that last, and they have to be perpetuated, They have to be perpetuated. You, you can't just, just do new things for the sake of doing them. There are certain things that have to be sustained. And the same things happen in families. Of course, number four, potential financial stability, right? Shared resources and support from extended family networks can offer financial stability. That's partly what the, you know, we talk about the bride price in ancient cultures. Um, you know, the, uh, the amount one family would pay to another. And we read it today as, you know, you're slavery, right? You're buying her. That may ha have happened in practice to a degree, but it, it, in spirit, what it was, it was, one fa it was the, the husband's family demonstrating that he can take care of her. So if I can give you this, you know I got a lot of money. And it wasn't just to say I have a lot of money. It was like, I'm ready. I'm in it for the long haul. I'm, I'm invested. And I can give you this much money, which means you know how much money I have to support her. And it was important to demonstrate that on the front end. These are important, right? Now, people are left to themselves today. People mainly find each other, what, online? I, I, have st I mean, it's interesting. I have, I've had students come to me at, at school, and they're like, how do I meet people? They're at a Christian college. But that's how bad it's gotten. Now, let me be fair here and talk about the drawbacks of arranged marriages, just to be fair, okay, right? So obviously... One of the uh, limited aspects of his lack of personal choice, individuals will, will feel pressured to marry someone they're not attracted to, their families have chosen, they have no autonomy, they feel like they won't be as happy. Um, there's also limited personal compatibility assessment, right? So my parents understand or my culture understands the long term, but really, I have a better sense of my own compatibility in terms of personality type, things I like to do, et cetera, right? They can feel like it's mismatched, there's potential Conflicts in terms of differences of expectations and values and personalities pronounced. And this, again, the Western world will emphasize these things. And this is what you see in movies. They're always about this. The, the young couple who doesn't want to do what their family, doesn't want to marry the person their families want them to marry. It's always in favor of the young couple. And that happens. We know this gets exploited and people can be exploited in these arranged marriage situations. But it never talks about the benefits of it because we live in the West. But if we look at our cultural reality, it's bad. Like there are individuals who are happy about their choices, but overall the culture, the overall happiness of the culture is low. And people are frustrated that they can't find anybody or meet anybody or all these other kind of things because you're, you're just left to yourself to figure it out without the support system, which is what arranged marriages gave you. 
That's really, people talk badly of patriarchies, but that's one of the benefits of a patriarchy is you are taken care of. Long term, you're not with somebody and you're wondering if they're going to be with you tomorrow. Because no one's defined the relationship. You've just been together for five, six, seven, eight years. What are we? I don't know. We're just talking. So I want to go through a, um, a description of an arranged marriage setup in Scripture. And again, I'm not saying, I don't think Scripture is saying you have to be in an arranged marriage. It just was written at a time where that was the norm. So that's what we see. Um, but it's interesting. I think there are a lot of principles here we can draw from. So let's go to Genesis 24, verse 1. We see Abraham here, verse 1. It says, now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. Okay, so this is how they make oaths here. So this is, in other words, Abraham was saying, take this very seriously. Take this very seriously, okay? Verse 3, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but go, will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. Very clear instructions. Now, the first thing I want you to observe here is Isaac is not part of this conversation. Isaac is not part of this conversation. He doesn't get to say, well, what about the folks over here? You didn't say that, right? Nope. He didn't say, I needed to be tall, I needed to be this, I needed to look like that. Nope. He's not involved. Okay? And he, he's very clear. He said, don't, I don't want you to marry. Now, they live in Canaan. But he doesn't want him to marry any of the women from the Canaanites. Now, this is not a racial thing. This is a values thing. First of all, God said, there's only certain folks I want you to marry for the purpose of preserving your faith. But beyond that, this is a values. They don't believe like us. And we know it's a values thing because we know there are Canaanites in the uh, lineage of Jesus, like Rahab, right? Because she came to belief. Her values changed, right? But there were certain folks they had that even though we live here, I don't want you marrying anybody from over here. Okay? But I want you to go to my country and my kindred. Why? Folks who are like-minded and have the same values. That, that, should be, that should be like a deal breaker for you in the dating world. You don't share the same values? Why are you with them? What are you looking to create with them? Now, there are exceptions, as I said last week, because my father was not a Christian when my mother met him. She was very much a Christian. Okay, they have their whole story. Maybe I'll come have them come up and share that. And I know people who, um, they got married, but when they got together, one of them was not a believer. So it happens, but don't build on that. Those are exceptions. Those are anomalies. And just sometimes God works things out that way for his reasons. But don't go looking for a situation like that. Don't go counting on a situation like that. Okay? So people like-minded, people who share values. Verse 5, the servant said to him, perhaps the women may not be willing to follow me to this land. She's got a choice in the matter, right? Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? So when he's talking about that, he's talking about the original place where God called Abraham, and those folks were pagans worshiping the moon. Um, they weren't godly either, right? So if I don't find them in Canaan, should I go to this other place? Where Should I go to your hometown, right? And Abraham said to him, verse 6, See to it that you do not take my son back there. Just because you're desperate, don't, don't get desperate and go backwards. 
See, when you're having trouble in the dating world and you had disappointment after disappointment, like you, you feel like he tried everything. So now I'm going to just, I, I mean, my, my clock is ticking. I, I, I'm going to just be open to anybody now because I just got to be with somebody. I'm tired of waiting. But don't give in to that. It's tempting. It's tempting. It says, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son, uh, uh, for my son from there. What is Abraham saying? You've got divine assistance. So I know it's a, you know, I'm giving you some limitations, but you've got divine assistance. How many of us invite the Lord into our dating life? and world. Don't raise your hand. Okay? It's a strange concept. First of all, we don't want to invite him in there because we don't know what he's going to say, but we already know what he's going to say. Right? Because, I mean, when you don't invite the Lord, you can just like who you like. You could just spend time with who you spend time with and say, well, I'm just getting to know them. Or they seem interesting. Or, you know, they're nice. Why don't I do such and such? When you know the Lord is going to weigh in. And not only the Lord, but we also know the Lord speaks through quality friends, advisors, and acquaintances. And you already know half the things you're doing, you won't be able to do anymore. And you have to do it on his terms. But what you don't realize is that this divine assistance is your fast pass. It seems like it's taking a long time, but he's really putting you at the front of the line to the person you need to be with. And you bypass all these jokers through divine assistance. You know, I was at, I've been, been mentioning Disney a lot, maybe because I've been watching the, 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 the documentary, but. We were at Disneyland, my, my, my family and I, last year, and we were, we, we had, you know, you, you, when you're there for a day, you're trying to get everything out of it. You know, we had the, the, the park hopper, and we was, you know, we wanted to see the fireworks, but we was running out of time, and we were trying to get to this place. We was all talking, deliberating. We, we weren't arguing. We were like, no, I want to do this, 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 that. And this cast member came up. You know, everybody's a cast member. That's what they call them. And came up, and she's like, well, she's like how can I make your day magical today? <laughs> she's like, she, and she, was like she was like, well, what if you, what if you can do both? Well, that'd be great. Well, great. I'm going to give you a fast pass. Now you can go see the fireworks, do this, and be back in time for that. We were like, okay, all right. So she was our assistant. And God is the same way, but we don't want to call on him because we don't want to change our ways. But you don't understand, with his assistance, you can have your cake and eat it too. So before he even embarked on the encounter, he sought divine assistance. Do you say... Do you seek divine assistance before you go to a social gathering? If you're in the market, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who I'm going to meet, but I'm open. I need divine assistance. Should I encounter someone that seems probable or likely? Help me to know who this person is. Help me to have the right posture. Help me to say the right things. Help them to see me and for me to see them. Now, some people, now, some people get real spooky about bringing the Lord into these things. They, can, they really can't. They think the Lord told me you my wife or you my husband and such and such and such and such. And God ain't told the other person anything. So don't be spooky and creepy. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying invite the Lord into the thought process. You don't have to tell them anything. You don't have to open your mouth. But just ask the Lord to be with you. So we got divine assistance here, right? And so verse 8 says, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So she may not be over there, but don't, don't take him back to these other spots, okay? So they swore and, and, and went on, okay? So, so, of course, he goes, his camels, he goes out to see uh, Abraham's family to find uh, Isaac a wife. And then in verse 12, and, he, and, and this is what the servant says. He says, and he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today. So he's been told that he has divine assistance, and now you see him praying, even before he gets there, that I, I need help from the Lord. And some of you, that's what you need. You, you, think about, you think about calling on God for bills. You think about calling for God for protection. You don't think about calling on God for 
dating. Do you know why you don't do that? Here's another reason. Because you're not that serious. You're not looking for a spouse. You're looking for a good time. And you know you don't need no help from God to do that. And, 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 I mean, certainly conclude, it can include premarital sex, but some of it is just, you know, the emotional frilly stuff. You know, you just want somebody on your arm. You, you, you want to have a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever, whatever it is you're going to call it, whatever people call it these days. They got all kind of names or no names, you know, for all that kind of stuff. But you just, you want to have that experience. And, you know, you don't need God for that because that's what the world does. You know, it, 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 you hear about people in the news who are famous and, oh, yeah, they're dating. What does that mean? Now, it ain't our business. We don't have to know, but it's all these ambiguous terms for people that don't really define the relationship because it doesn't require a commitment because they're both friends with benefits. Friends with benefits. But those benefits come with a cost to you emotionally, spiritually, physically. So the servant says, grant me success today. Right? And, then he, and then he says, he, he says, um, verse 13, he says, Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young women to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. In other words, listen, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go out, and this is how I'm going to know that she's the one, okay? There's certain qualities I'm looking for. In other words, he wanted a clear sign that she met the criteria. Many of us don't require that. They had us at hello. You should not be dating somebody you know you're not going to marry. You know you're not going to marry them. And be honest with yourself about that. But they're giving you all this attention. You need a clear sign. And sometimes we're so desperate, we'll make up a sign. <laughs> Lord, you see that? See that? See, see that? See that gold tooth? See it sparkling? This thing was so specific, it can't just happen by accident. This was a clear sign from the Lord, right? All right, so he goes, and then he says, uh, verse 15, before he had finished speaking, and he's in the middle of the prayer. He's still praying, right? But before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with the water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. So here we have, she's attractive, right? So this is, God is showing us that this is not unimportant. Like, so it's not like you, you should have no connection to them physically or emotionally, okay? But, but none of the criteria is based on that. You can't build a relationship on attractive, physical attraction. You just can't. It need to be there, but you can't build on that. Otherwise, men, attractive people would just have the longest, most successful marriages ever. Sometimes they're the ones that have the worst challenges. People you think, oh, man, they're so attractive, man, they shouldn't have any problems. But no, that's not the thing. You can't, you can't, you can't build on that, right? Okay. So she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Now, no, now listen, the reason why he's out here is that the, that's the only time you're going to find women out in public like that. Not, maybe not the only time, but one of the few times, again, in a society like this, it's not like you can go out to the store and run into people and say hi. You can't do that. There were just er, certain times a day where it would be socially appropriate to engage like that. 
And what we do in the dating culture, we no longer have sacred spaces, and maybe sacred is too strong, but spaces that are appropriate to start having this kind of thing. We're just open to all kind of stuff. We, we, don't, we have no decorum or propriety. We don't wait for the right time. We're just dropping lines on everybody we see because they're there. Now, there's nothing wrong with a pickup line. I think in certain contexts, fine. There's nothing wrong with flirting in the right context. I mean, like, how they going to know you interested unless you say you're interested? Right? So that's fine. But some people, they just don't have any limits. And I knew, and I, as, a, as, as, a, as a young man pondering a relationship before I got married, at younger, I, I, well, per, first of all, my personality is not such to just go up to every person I see who's attractive and have a pickup line. That just wasn't my personality, right? And there's some guys, not only do they have the personality, they got the charm and everything to pull that off, okay? Um, I wasn't like that, but I also didn't think it was a good look to just have a pickup line for every attractive woman I saw. I just didn't think, eh, I, don't, I don't know if that's a good look. I should be more selective. And if I'm interested that I'm even talking to you means I've already vetted you. I've already observed you. I've already done my homework and my research. And that's what this guy is doing on Isaac's behalf. He's doing his research. He ain't even talked to her yet. But he's observing her character. So he's looking. Now he's, he's asking her a question that has nothing to do with romance. He's asking her a practical question. So it says, uh, it says uh, verse 16, the young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden who no man had known, she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. He wants to see how she's going to respond. She, she, she's passed the attraction test, but that's not really the basis. Verse 18 says, she said, drink, my Lord, and she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Now, she is thorough. She don't know him. She don't know what he's going to do, what he's about, but he is watching her. And the manner in which she is serving him. So she quickly, notice how quickly she did. She didn't take her time. She didn't say, I don't know you. She didn't say all that kind of stuff. She was like, she was showing the kind of hospitality you're supposed to show to a stranger in that time and culture, and she was participating in that. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water, and she drew for all his camels. His whole, he didn't just come by himself. He had a whole entourage. Remember uh, Aladdin? Prince Ali, da, 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 da. Remember he came down with the elephants and the whole nine? I mean, it was not all like that, but he, Abraham wasn't poor. He was not poor. So he's like, verse 21, the man gazed at her in silence. Let me just stop there. <laughs> Sometimes that's what you got to do. You got to watch and don't open your mouth. Brothers. Sisters, watch and don't open your mouth and see what they do. Because the, by the time it gets to hello, again, if we're talking, that means your resume and your cover letter has made the first cut. That I'm even here talking to you at the water cooler like this. Because normally I'm going to keep it at some distance. Not, I'm not trying to be standoffish or anything like that. But I'm not trying to leave, you know, these days, you want, I'm not trying to leave you with the impression that I'm interested when I'm not interested or don't know that I should be interested in you. We talked last week about the, 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 the levels of intimacy and connection and how we have a circle of intimacy here and there's layers. And you got one right here, move from, you got one right here, and you got one right here. And you got people over here that you take them straight to the center of intimacy day one. And I talked about the last service. You don't even have to wait. Some people have the one-night stands, but they don't even wait till there. They are doing foreplay on the dance floor 
with somebody they just met. They don't even know each other. And, you know, we're in this culture where the more freaky it gets, the more excited everybody else gets. We are cheering them on, and they, they are strangers. They don't know each other. And we all know it's, it's foreplay. They just met two seconds ago. And then they'll probably be in the bed in an hour. You just met them. That's insane. They shouldn't even, they shouldn't even have the emo, all the emotions with you yet, let alone the physical. And it don't even have to be sexual. I mean, it, you don't have to be doing the act of sex for the physical part of it to have you entangled already. I'm, I'm just being real, y'all. This, this is where we are. Because when you, spend, when you spend time with that, this is the thing. This is why you need to get married, because really, your whole relationship is foreplay. Everything in the relationship is when you spend time together, you do things together, it's taking you back to the prospect of sexual intimacy. And when you start spending time with people, you don't even know if you can even commit to them yet. You are entangled long before, long before the vetting process has happened, and then you're just tied to them. Emotional, even, let's, let's lay aside kids for a second. Lay aside diseases for a second. Just emotionally tied to them. Where you can't even, you, you, they move, they in another state, uh, they in another part of the world, and they still in your head. You, you, be, you, you be online and be like, what's Shorty doing right now? Well, I wonder what Shorty doing. Look on their Facebook, and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to see what they doing. Let's continue with this story here, okay? So, what I leave off here? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Man, I may have to take some of this for next week. But we're good as far as we can get today, okay? So, the man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had, uh, uh, yeah, he's gazing at her in silence. Because even, so, she, so she's an attractive woman. She passed the character test. Here's what he knows. She's clearly ready for marriage. Now, how would you know that from that? Well, first, just being in that culture, there's things you would know that you wouldn't pick up today. But even with these signs, he's still saying, Lord, I'm waiting on you. I, I, you, you, you still can, I, this still could, I can still decide that I'm not going to choose her, but I'm just, I want to make sure it's you, okay? So, but then after he finally saw it, he was like, no, she the one, right? So verse 22 says, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, weighing a half shekel and two braces for her arms, weighing 10 gold shekels. What was he doing? He was taking some of his money, his gold and jewels, and giving her, giving it to her, which is a clear sign that there's some interest there, not from him, but on behalf of his master's son, right? So first of all, again, he's demonstrating his capacity to take care of her, that she'll be taken care of, no question, right? And he's also saying, I'm serious. I've got skin in the game. Notice how quickly he is demonstrating his intention. That needs to be done early. Maybe, it may or may not, I mean, it doesn't have to be on the first date per se, but it, this shouldn't be strung along for years, and you guys don't know where you stand. Something wrong with that. That's wrong. That doesn't even make sense. I mean, it may, I know why, but it just, like, we're not talking about something here. Right? So he has the intention. He says, and, 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 and this, the next thing he wants to know not what she liked to, you know, what her favorite music is and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Verse 23 says, and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night, right? I want to meet your dad. 
I want to know who your family is. And I want to talk to your father. We've lost that. We've lost that. Well, I don't know her dad. Talk to her mama then. Whoever is in, whoever's head of that household, you sit there and have a conversation with him or her. Let them know your intentions. Even if they don't care, tell them anyway. And she said to him, look what she said. She didn't talk about, you know, this is how I express myself. She was like, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She had her whole family lineage. I am who my family is. That's my identity. That's how people used to self-identify. I am who my father and my grandfather or my mother and my grandma, I am who they are. And if you want me, you get them too. You get our culture, you get our tradition. This is what we're about. We don't do that anymore. And then she went on to talk, offered more hospitality, and he's, he's already sold. Like, he, he in. This is a done deal for, for, for the servant, right? So Rebecca, verse 29, verse 29. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Listen, Laban, because she went into the house and tells everybody, Laban sees the gold on her arm, and listen, he didn't walk. Laban ran. He ran out toward the man to the spring. He was like, what? Okay, what, what are we doing? Who is this? Which is what your family should do. They should go and check this out. Who are you? What are you about? What are your intentions? What do you, what do you, what do you plan to do? Is this real? It should happen very early on. And I, and I say this, listen, you need to do this with your daughters, but also your sons. I was saying the last service, you know, just listen, I got two sons, and when they're of age, I'm checking out who they're bringing home. Who are you? I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say it like that. <laughs> I'm going to get the information. I'm not going to say like, but in my mind, who are you? Why are you here? How did you meet my son? Who are your parents? Who are your family? What are your intentions? Why are you here? What are your values? What do you believe in? So he runs out and, you know, he saw the rings and stuff. And so they go in, they have dinner, they have, you know, they're connected and all because he's doing all the things that. There are certain social rules for engagement if you're looking for a wife or a husband and the servant is following them. There's a script. This is why it was easier back then because it wasn't like you had to go, there was a script you follow and you do this, then you know it means that. And the servant is following all the rules and her household is following all the rules. That's how you know, okay, this is legit. But if you don't come like that, then you're not legit. And so they ha they're sitting down for about to eat. Verse 33 says, then the food was set out before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. The servant was like, I'm not here for pleasantries. He said, okay, speak on, right? And we live in this age where people need all this time to feel, I don't know if I, you know, I don't know, we're just doing this and just doing that. You need time for that, but not as much time as you think. And on the other hand, I'm, I would, now, listen, I'm not telling anybody to get married. I, that, that's the decision you have to make, your final decision. But I'm saying, if you're just in limbo, you need to state your intentions on the front end. And I know for some of the ladies, it's, it's difficult because you don't want to scare him away. I know. And it's like, how do you, you don't want on the first date that grill them with 30 questions, you know, you know, do the background check, all that kind of stuff. But you also need to know this. I can't take my, the things that are precious to me emotionally and physically and spiritually and just give them to you. You don't want me to give them to you. And I don't know you. You've promised me nothing. You can leave tomorrow. But we live in a culture where that's okay. So I totally understand that. And so what you got to do is what Rebecca did. She was already, she was already in wife mode before Isaac's family got there. If you in wife mode, 
the scumbag's not going to even talk to you. They're not. They can, they can, they, they sense all your wife energy. They ain't ready for that. They don't want that. And the, 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 the guys who like the wife energy, they bring in husband energy. And you can see them, but you can see the guys who have husband, they're not husbands, they're single, but they bring in husband energy, like the servant. Now, Isaac's not there, but his representative is there. His representative is there, and he's bringing husband energy. That's how you know. And you don't, you, you are interviewing every applicant. Don't do that. They should spell date with, they should spell date with two A's. Data. Go on a data. Go get some data. Go get some information. That's what you need. It don't take, they just met, and they about to get married. Because you don't need all the touchy-feely stuff. You do, but it, it ain't the, that's the icing. The cake, values. Upbringing, family life. And let me say this, everybody ain't had the perfect background, I understand that, so you don't have to, nobody has a perfect, even people who look like, who did come from a perfect background, they didn't really come from a perfect background, and they're going to have, they, you're going to deal with them too when you get married, right? So nobody has perfect anything, okay? But you, you, you want somebody who is ready to take this marriage journey seriously, like you take it seriously. And you go, you go to your therapeutic stuff, get your therapeutic evaluation. Okay, well, this is what he got to deal with. This is his background he's dealing with, and this is what her background, what we're dealing with. Okay, so this is our stuff. We know, we know it's there. We're going to deal with it together with our family and our advice and all that kind of, we're going to go resourced with our spiritual community supporting us, and there will be ups and downs, but we're going to be all right. You know, when I, I, I tell this story, it's a strange story. I don't recommend it to anybody. I'm just telling you what happened to me. But my lovely wife and I, we used to tell the story all the time, how we got together. She came to this church, and uh, we, used to, we had a dance ministry, and she was a new dancer. And I said, who's that new dancer? It was her. I said, who that? <laughs> Guys don't need a lot of time. They know often immediately, but they definitely don't need 10 years. They don't, they say... If a guy is taking a long time, it's one of two reasons. One, he's a good dude, and he's just has to, he's afraid. He don't want to mess it up, and he just need patience. You just need patience with him, okay? But no, that's who you with, though. You pick them. You pick somebody who needs that, right? But I'm just saying, some good, they, they good dudes. They just, they ain't seen a lot of marriages work out, that kind of stuff, and they don't want to mess it up with you. Or maybe they've been in a relationship, and it got messed up, Okay? But, but, but really, guys don't need a lot of time. Sometimes with women, a guy can grow on him, on her, but with a dude, it don't really work like that. He kind of knows what he wants. And if he's taking his time, something's up. You need to figure it out by prayer or however you figure it out, talk to him, whatever it is. But, but, and you got to figure out if you want to, if you want to, yeah, stick with it. Listen, guys, women have a clock. They just do. They, women know from little girls, they can't waste no time. They can't. There are too many things at stake. And you having her wait? You having her wait? We ain't ready. <laughs> okay. Okay. One day, you're going to want to have sex. And you're going to be like, what's up? And she's going to be like, I'm not ready yet. Well, when are you going to get ready? I don't know. What if she made you wait a year? What if she made you wait two years? Oh, that ain't right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm married to her. Man, she can't do all that. That's, that's, that's wrong. But you made her wait 13 years before you married her. I'm not saying she need to get you back. I'm just saying, think about how you would feel if somebody made you wait for something, she can't, she can't make you marry her. I know I need to stop here. I, I probably do. Let me just say this one last thing. I, I, I just, let me just say it like this. So 
I, I'll end it with this, and we'll get back to this next week. But I, I said in my singles message a couple months ago about God is not judging you based upon your marital status, and he isn't. If you want to get married and stay single, that's totally up to you. God's not judging you based on that. The world does. The culture does. So don't feel in bondage about it. Enjoy your singleness. If you're single, enjoy your married life if you're married, right? What I also want to say is there are people who are not getting married for impure reasons. Male and female, but I want to specifically speak to guys. And first of all, let me say this. There are guys out there who desperately want to get married and are not, being, are not successful. There's a whole population of men like that who just feel rejected. Nobody's interested in them, and they just get no's. All, and guys get a lot of no's. That's a lot of times why they don't ask. Because it's just, it's just debilitating to be rejected. So it's guys out there, but they just, you know, so there's guys like that. But there's also men who just like, nah, I don't want to do that. She's going to take all my money. Women do this. And, you know, the whole red pill thing. I just want to say, I have, a, I have a friend from high school who, uh, man, I ran into him, I don't know, three, four years ago. And I, I was at a T-ball, no, actually longer than three, four years ago, because Jose was playing T-ball. Um, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but he was there getting ready. His kid was doing football or something like that. And man, he got four kids. I think it's three boys and a girl. And we were just catching up. We hadn't talked in years. And we grew up in the city together, and it's like, man, it's like, man, what, what you doing with a family, man? What you doing? And he was like, I know. I never imagined this for myself. Like, I'm like, me and these kids married all the time, doing the domestic. I, I just never thought. And it's like, you remember me in high school? I was all about me. I never thought that a family would make me so happy. And he was just like, it was just this secret thing he just discovered. But if he just went with how the culture talks about it, he would have rejected it. And, and sometimes guys think, you know, she's going to slow me down or the kid's going to slow me down. You're right. They are. They are. I mean, you have to slow down. I mean, you don't have to. I mean, but if you don't, you, you're going to mess up your family. You can't do all the things you want to do. You, you're going to have, you're going to be up at night. You got morning routine, nighttime routine, uh, uh, somebody throwing up. Uh, you got Little League games and, and baseball games and football games and late nights and your kids got these activities and, you know, everybody asking you for money. You, 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 you get, we was all talking about, I was talking about yesterday with some folks, we had this marriage thing and they were like, this guy was like, I don't know, I don't know why you asked me to keep cash because I just, I'm just storing it for you. You're just going to ask, you're going to ask me for it. The kids going to ask me for it. You're going to sacrifice. But it's so fulfilling. There's, now, you can have joy as a single person, so I'm not saying you have to get married to be fulfilled, but you just have no idea how your wife will enhance your life. I'm a different dude. I've been married to this woman for over 23 years. I'm, a, I'm smarter. I'm wiser. There's dumb things I don't do anymore. Because I've been living with her and growing with her with another person who's grounded, wise, compliments me, all those kind of things. I'm so happy about that. And yes, I've, I've had to sacrifice some of, the things, some of the things personally that I want to do, but it's come back to me. And whatever you want to do in your career, I, I get it. I understand it. But don't don't feel judged that you have to get married because the culture says so, but don't resist it when God is not telling you or demanding it. There might be a young woman you've seen on your mind, and you keep like, nah, you try to flick it off. Or maybe there's somebody you're with now, and you in that quasi-relationship phase. You do it in sports. You do it at work. Make a commitment. Watch how it blesses your life. But what if this happens? What if that happens? What if it happens? 
got the Lord. You got this beautiful woman who's smart, who's intelligent, and has your back. She'll go through a wall for you. Why wouldn't you want that? There's some men here, some of you watching online, there's some things you desperately want. For some of you, the pathway is through marriage and family. It really is. And you really are, you're missing out if you're resisting it for impure reasons. For, this is my emphasis. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to pressure you. I'm saying for impure reasons. And we bash, marriage is bashed so heavily in our culture. You're just hearing you know, when they gonna take advantage of you, when they gonna you, but you just around all that toxic energy all the time. Answer the call in your life to find your relationship, ask her out, ask her to marry you, trust God, get marriage counseling. Don't wait for the wedding date to get marriage counseling. Start it well before you even have a, I know that's not romantic, but it's the smart thing to do. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we just thank you and praise you for your, for your wisdom, for your grace, for your mercy. I just want to take, I, I, I'm just, I want to continue to pray for the, the, the men I've been speaking to. And I don't, you don't, only you know if it's you. Only you know if it's you. But I just want to pray for you. Just for even listening to this. Because uh, as men, we, we, people are always uh, telling us what we need to do. Uh, we got to get better, do better. And, and I know that's some element of this. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want you to miss out on something that can give you so much joy and peace. And I, I, it's hard to see it, but brother, your wife is going to help you. There's some things you just, it's just, it's just, you're just struggling with it. And with her in your life, it's going to be easy. Things that have been elusive for you for years are going to be easy. There's going to be wisdom that comes out of her mouth that will save your life that will save your career. And I don't know if there are children that are gonna be in your life at some point, I don't know. But those children are gonna enrich your life in ways you can only imagine. And yes, I, I, hear, I, I'm, I hear some of you, not literally, but in my mind, you recalling men in your life who were not good fathers and not good husbands, and you don't want to be that, I know, but that doesn't mean you will be that. They didn't have the benefit of sitting here right now, hearing these messages with the resources that are at their disposal. You do. Father, bless these men. Make their hearts tender before you. May they be men after God's own heart like David was. May they have a heart for, for worship. May they have a heart to serve you. Those questions they have in their mind about what if, Lord, all those don't go away all, 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 all right away. For Lord, I pray they will sense your guiding presence in their life and that even if those questions aren't answered right now, that they'll have a peace from you about their next step. Surround them with the people in their lives that need to encourage them, Lord God. Give them godly friendships and godly advisors. Help them move forward in their faith, Lord God. Call them to yourself. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Um, didn't do a traditional altar call today. You know, I'm always open to what the Spirit of God will do.
and that's where I was led this morning. But uh, I want to thank you for coming this Sunday. And